okay. okay. You, you're talking about via Zoom or physically? Physically. In person. Oh, right. Okay. It, it takes years to become great at it. And this is where, again, the sports analogies come in. You know, how many years of playing cricket does it take where you can become one of those greats? If you become successful, you have more pain than you can ever imagine. Um, <laughs> you need to get used to that. You need to get used to being punched in the face regularly. Um, but practice, practice method. You know, read lots of psychology books. There's another great, there's other great books. Best Loser Wins by Tom Hugard. Don't go out there and want to become a millionaire overnight. Um, oh. So go through them and practice and learn. Keep a journal, keep a diary as you're doing it. Who is the favorite sports person from India, especially in cricket field? Sanyo Kavisco. So I think it's been a very long time. You finally you agreed and you have given me the time. So thank you for that. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be on here. <laughs> great, great, great. Stephen, so before we begin, let me tell you the ground rules. There is no rules. Actually, there are a set of questions <laughs> which I would be asking to you and you have to answer those questions simply in your words. Okay. Great. No, I'm, great. I'm happy to talk. I love, I love talking. So... <laughs> Great, great, great. So, uh, before we begin, uh, Stephen, I wanted you to please take us through your journey. When did you start it? How did you start it? And what motivates you to come into this field? I suppose a little bit about myself. My name is Stephen Goldstein. Um, I am the author of a new book, Mastering the Mental Game of Trading. Um, but really, I mean, that that book really is about my, it's not about, but it's inspired by my 40-year journey um, in trading and from being a trading coach. So I started trading back in the mid 1980s. I worked for several investment banks here in London. Um, and uh, I, I, I spent nearly 25 years in the hot seat as a trader. And, um, and then I moved into performance coaching. And that was inspired by um, work I'd done with a performance coach at roughly the halfway stage of my career, um, which really sort of changed my trajectory as a trader. I think, you know, whilst I was doing okay for many years, there was a lot of ups and downs, a lot of uh, volatility in performance, a lot of struggles, some triumphs, but it, it wasn't consistent. And working with that coach and going through that experience at that point in my career really transformed things for me. And um, the next... The next part of my career, the, the second phase was just completely different in terms of success, consistency, ability to put risk at work in the markets, uh, ability to monetize the ideas I had, which were always very good, but I was always challenged in terms of getting the most out of them. Um, and then 10 years later, a follow-up conversation with that same coach inspired me to, to, to sort of leave trade behind and move to becoming a coach working with traders and then since then i've coached you know um many hundreds of traders from across the markets um uh, from leading hedge fund traders to investment bank traders propriety traders individual retail traders um groups of traders as well as you know people connected to trading and um that experience, you know, learning and hearing other people's stories, um, hearing about their own challenges and also seeing what, what, what has driven their success, alongside my own studies in, in, in fields of performance that I felt would be useful. So I studied coaching, coaching techniques, I studied psychotherapy, I studied trauma, all these things that are part of what leads to great performance. And all that has come together, all those experiences, <laughs> In this book, Mastering the Mental Game of Trading. Okay, so very interesting story. And definitely based on that, I have curated a very good question for you. But before we begin with the question, I wanted to know what motivates you to write your latest book, which has been released globally in 16 Jan 2024, The Mastering Mindset. Why is with the mindset? What is what is behind the mindset? Why mindset is very important while doing trading? Okay, well, I, I think I knew... Um, and have known, but it became even clearer that the key to success in trading is is winning the mental game. Okay, there's a quote um, 
which comes from mountaineering actually and it's 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 said by sir edmund hillary who was the first man to climb mount everest um that he said it's not the mountain we conquer it's ourselves and that quote uh, could be said reset as restated as it's not the markets we conquer it's ourselves and, and what i love about that quote is it, it captures this element that there's there's two sides to any performance activity there's the technical skills okay which is the learning to climb the mountain learning to find an approach of how to win in the markets and then there's the human the impersonal the, the the mental skills which is really you know once you have those technical capabilities that's the real battle hmm. you know once you know how to climb the mountain which of course is no easy feat it's really what goes on in there that's the battle and it's the same with markets markets are not that complex or complicated in terms of finding a way to win in them okay not technically you know we know that because a lot of people make money when they paper trade or can make money on simulations it's it's when they try and do that for real in the real world that that comes into play mm. and that gets in the way and that corrupts and that becomes the big challenge um so for me that is always that that phrase that quote has summed up that battle i mean obviously you need to have both but that could be acquired but that has to be developed and that is the hardest part and that was what led me towards you know writing that book and, and and i was approached by a publisher you know who felt having read some of my you know online comments and blog posts that you know i had something unique to say in terms of this battle you know it's been addressed in many books but i was coming from a unique perspective so uh can we say that uh mindset takes 80 percent of your trading and 20 percent is technical skills uh it's it's quite difficult to actually sort of quantify that i mean i i believe they're both 100 percent and i know that sounds crazy but you know if you don't have the technical skills you won't succeed so it's a hundred percent of that and if you don't have the mindset skills you won't succeed so it's a hundred percent of that i mean if you want to go and put them as 50 50 but you know the, the the two work together to try and separate them out is is impossible so that's why i say it's both for both of them it's a hundred percent of getting them right Great, great, wonderful. And you know, like uh, in your book, you have also mentioned uh, there is a like uh, there are two types of trading, which is a player style and one is what house style. So, what was that context yeah. for? Right. Well, you know, I, I probably hadn't realized that conceptually when I was a trader, um, but as I went through this work and as I had loads more conversations with people, it really dawned on me that everyone is doing either one type of training or another i did myself and everyone is specializing in one type or the other they can do bits of both but they can only be specialists in one they can migrate across to changing styles but the idea that there is one type of trading is is what throws a lot of people out so so i think the best way of describing that is perhaps using the term stops you know everyone says you know it's one of the most contentious things in trading should we use a stop and, and you know I, I believe ultimately as as a backstop everyone should have a stop in there somewhere mm. okay but in our day-to-day -day trading should we always use them the answer is both yes and no and that depends on which style of trading you're doing yes okay and, and then you can go a little bit deeper even in both styles you, you will use them but for me in one style you have to use a stop all the time or the equivalent of a stop in other words it could be buying an option um, which has a stop when it's worthless um, but you're limited to the premium you've paid for the option whereas the other side it's open-ended it's a bit like selling an option hmm. okay sure. you, you can't you know so and when you do that it's very difficult to work out where the stop should be because there's so many different 
parts of it. Is it time? Is it volatility? Is it delta? Is it gamma? There's all these different elements. Is it price? Um, so, you know, if you're running a short options portfolio, if you're running a spread portfolio, okay, even if you're scalping, it's very difficult sometimes to just leave a stop in there because you're, you're actually trying to monetize that uncertainty um, and that complexity. If you're doing the other side, if you're picking a level to enter the market and you're identifying a risk reward play and you're committing a certain amount of capital to the trade or a certain amount of loss, then you have to have a stop. It, it's a no brainer and you can use stops aggressively in that you can trail them and they can become part of the tool. Okay. Ultimately, in the end, both somewhere need to stop because you could be just completely taken out and, you know, lose your entire account or your house with it if you're not careful. But in terms of day to day trading, so those two approaches, those two I call the house and the player. And the reason I look, I, I call them that is because I, I, I use um, I use a metaphor based around blackjack to describe yeah those two methods you've probably seen it in a book um, where one side you're using the approach as if you were the casino as if you were the house as if you were playing for the house um, so that is that is very difficult um, when you do that to um, to just take the site the opposite approach okay and you have a natural advantage being the house you have a positive expectancy and you're trying to monetize that positive expectancy and the entire return profile the entire way you do that is completely different to the game you play on the other side of the blackjack table when you're the player when you're approaching the game when you actually don't have an edge or you don't have an advantage you have a negative expectancy but then you're trying to use certain tools and tricks to create a positive expectancy and you have to be a lot more um specific about the trade a lot more strategic a lot more tactical around how you do it but there's lots of different elements to those two sides one is a constant risk approach one is where you step in and you step out you're not always positioned in the market one you're constantly positioned um, and, and, and the mindsets of the two approaches are very different. The structures of the two approaches are very different. Uh, the nuances of the two approaches are very different. And after what you find is that a lot of people are trying to do both together and getting themselves in a mess. Yeah. Now, even saying that, everyone does a little bit of both together. If you specialised in one side, there's elements of the other side that can help you. If you specialise in that side, there's aspects of that side that you can bring in to add extra value. But generally, if you look at the two sides, you specialize in one side or the other. And that's what makes you your money. Mm. And when you mix them, it becomes messy. Mm. Very true, very true. Genuinely, genuinely, very true. But yes, uh, now let's move on to our next question. Uh, Stephen, could you please tell me, based on your vast experience, what are the most significant challenges traders face in today's market compared to when you started in 1980s? Okay. okay. Um, well, at the core, the challenges are exactly the same. There is no difference. You know, the challenge is human. Okay. The markets are very different, of course. Um, you know, liquidity is completely changed um you know nearly every single market has high levels of liquidity and markets then had much lower levels of liquidity um that also meant that you know there was there was far more fat to be creamed from the market if you knew how to and if you had access to it so what's different now is that it was really a professional market only then um it was very difficult for well, it was impossible for people to do it from home virtually. You know, they had to go to an exchange and they had to join the exchange, be part of the exchange. You could invest in the market. That's different. I'm talking specifically about trading here. Um, investing has always been accessible, but even then, it's far more liquid now. The markets are much tighter. You know, 
So that they, I mean, it, the amount of people in the markets is phenomenal. You know, there's tens of millions of people engaging with markets every single day, hedging markets. But that means that spreads have come in incredibly tight. It's much harder to cream off the top of the market. You know, but if if you're you know if you're skillful and if you learn the skills and the resources that are out there now are incredible. Mm. You know, um, but you know, still there is that only that very small percentage that actually make it, which which it, it's a small percentage, but it's a lot of people when you think of how many people are actually doing it. Um, the skills needed to do it are probably different i would say just simply because of the the tools that you have available you know that the amount of systemic tools systematic tools you have the sheer amount of data that's available that you didn't have before you know the ability to uh, apply quantitative systems and you know our al build algorithms and ai systems that can help and add value you know i mean that was just you know we, we were using old handheld calculators in those days to work out value but you, you were trading probably a lot more off the top of your head in those days mm -hmm. well said well said well uh, i think even i believe that in early days we don't have too much of resources but yes because of the internet nowadays people have a lot of resources and they can study and they can do well now right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. wonderful so you like you have also mentioned earlier that risk management so my next question is based on risk management that how do you guide traders in developing effective risk management techniques and what are the some common mistakes that you see in this area? Right, okay. Well, I, as you know, risk management is a kind of non-negotiable. Um, and, you know, people get in all sorts of mess with risk management. And that's one of the biggest challenges doing the house approach from your own home. Okay, the house approach, as we say, requires constant risk, constant exposure in the market all the time and you know if you think of that casino analogy and to use that you know the house approach is like trying to replicate what it's like to be the casino okay and to try and capture that natural edge now a big part of being the casino or thinking of the companies that play the role of the casino in the markets the big banks the exchanges, um, the energy firms, the commodity firms, okay, the brokers, um, they have vast risk management resources available. You know, incredible systems um, built by, you know, very smart people managed by quants. Um, it costs a huge amount of investment in it. And it gives them an almost real time um, printout of what your risk exposure is. And then they have senior risk managers that can come on and just tap you on the shoulder and say, you've got to close down your position, you've got to reduce your position. Yeah. You don't have that when you're working from home on your own. You're very, it's very easy to override your risk rules, your risk parameters, and get yourselves into a mess. Okay, um, so that's part of the challenge of doing the house approach from home. And the the paradox of that is nearly everyone starts off doing the house approach. Okay. Um, because it's it's simpler. In a way, it, it's, it's quicker to generate a profit from it. You know, you can just start using a simple house approach system very quickly um, and, and apply that. And, you know, you can, you can relatively quickly start generating some income. But it has that downside. It has that risk attached to it that risk element that you expose yourself to um the player approach is is more sophisticated there are a lot of people that start off doing the player approach but it takes much longer to start generating an income from that to be you know specialist in it this, this to me both both approaches are specialist that takes a lot longer though to become specialist at um it's but it's easier to run risk you commit a certain amount of capital to every trade you use a stop okay um i i, I you know the biggest messes come from not having a, a, a real handle on risk management 
Mm. You know, so it, it, it's about helping people understand what they're doing and then helping people also understand, you know, really what is your risk management approach? Because most people don't have a good handle on it. They think they do. So I wouldn't say I teach risk management. You know, it's it, it, it's about helping people understand the importance of it and really working on developing it within their own, you know, it's part of their system or method within the system or method they use. I don't teach system or method, okay? When I coach people, they already have a, a technique or a method or an approach that they have. It's, it's one of the reasons I don't work with new traders. They have to have developed their technical skills first. Mm. Okay, they have to have that quite well advanced. And then I'll sort of unpick it with them, look into it with them, help them understand the nuances of what they're doing and where they can improve it and where, where they're challenged. Very true, very true. Well said. So, you know, as we have talked about the mindset and risk management, now it comes to strategies. So, in your view, how should traders adapt their strategies in response to rapid market changes and technological advancements? Okay. So, and you know, again, I talk about process rather than strategy. Okay. Strategy comes out of that when you understand your process, when you have a really deep understanding of what you do, and that's a big part of the book, you know, it's called the, the, there's an image on the front of it called the performance process cycle. Okay. And that is a framework which runs all the way through the book, which I've adapted and brought from psychotherapy to trading. And it, it, it's a way of understanding the tasks you're doing in trading all the time and reflecting on it and revisiting it and, and, and improving it and building it and adapting it to evolution in yourself and the market. Okay. It's an ongoing process, hence a cycle. Okay. And you should be always looking at where you are on the cycle, what you're doing. Now, part of that is um, adapting to change. There's four quadrants to it. Okay. When you review what's going on in the market, you're evolving your strategy. You know, a strategy may work and it may stop working, but it doesn't mean you ditch it. You have to find out if it stopped working because it's no longer valid. It only worked in a set of market conditions. Or is it valid over time, but it just goes through periods where it underperforms, which is just, which means you don't change it. You have to just work through that. Every strategy underperforms at times. Okay. Every strategy underperforms in certain market conditions. You know, some strategies, they, they work relatively sparsely, but when they do work, they bring enormous returns. So you have to go through the periods when they don't work and you have to not abandon it because you don't know when those returns will come back, but they will come back at some point if it's a robust multi-year strategy. Hmm. Right. There are certain things where you can try and there's some strategies which evolve with the market conditions. Market conditions are gone to a low volatility condition then you have to adapt evolve that strategy for that and then when it goes back to a high volatility volatility um sort of environment then you readapt this strategy that is incredibly hard to do that is where you're a real specialist okay <laughs> you know the, the the market doesn't ring a bell when it changes market conditions very true very true very true very true well like, you know like i have a very silly question now could you please tell me a trader should have how many strategies with them? Like one strategy, two strategies, three strategies, <laughs> depending on the markets. Okay, so I, got, I, got, I call a strategy more of a playbook. That's the term I refer to in the in the book. And I, I'm not going to tell anyone what the right number of strategies there are. I know people have a single playbook, okay? And they play that strategy as defined by their playbook the whole time. I know people who have multiple playbooks. You know, they might have one for a bullish environment, a bearish environment, a benign sideways environment. You know, that's three. Um, they might have one where they use uh, strategies that are spread based, that are, you know, running short of options. They might even have strategies for playing both sides of the market, a player strategy and a house strategy. And, and you know, there, there are people I know that do that. Um, you have to be very, very good and experienced to do that. Okay. Um, you have to be able to go, 
literally remove yourself and, and put your head somewhere else for that. Uh, there's very few people that can do that. They can mm. probably count them on one hand. Um, there, there's people that, you know, they don't really have a defined strategy. That's people who are more in the house. They more have a philosophy to how they engage with the markets. And they couldn't actually define their strategy as one, but it's more reacting to, and that's more of a house approach, reacting to what's going on in the market. So they might have an approach. That's another way of looking at it. Okay, you might be a relative value trader, a spread trader. Okay, and you don't necessarily necessarily have a specific strategy, but you have an approach to um, how you increase, decrease, manage risk within that. Mm. Okay, you may have tactics within that that you could define as a strategy when you put them collectively together. But I think of it as more of an approach, and that's where you can define the playbook. Okay. A strategy can be a subcomponent of that. You might suddenly notice, I, I don't know, a particular um, uh, sort of set of circumstances had, happening. You know, maybe, you know, global conflict, maybe um, rising inflation, maybe central bank policy, um, maybe lots of stock buybacks happening. Um, and you may just print a single strategy that you can apply within your approach. So do you see what I mean? It's a, it's a very broad term that that has lots of different, um, I suppose, ways, ways of understanding it. That's why I like to sort of get people to think about their playbook. You know, what is the approach? What is the philosophy? You know, uh, how do I adapt my strategies? Am I strategic about the market or am I strategic about the way I approach the market? So <laughs> it's such a complex uh, you know, job and activity. <laughs> completely, completely. I understand. This is clearly a complete, <laughs> complex subject. But yes, uh, let's move forward. Uh, could you please tell me what are the key elements do you believe are essential in building a successful and a sustainable trading strategy? Again, what, how, how would you define strategy when you ask that question? Once you know about your mindset, your pros, then you can define a strategy. I am okay. not a trade trader, so I will not. I will not look for the day trading strategy. I will go for long term, long term trading strategy. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so, so for me, you have to align an approach. So let's. I'm going to use the term approach for now. You have to align and build an approach that aligns with who you are. Yes. Your and a, you know, I call this, you know, the sort of alignment element, you know, aligns with your philosophy, aligns with your uh, resources, your lifestyle, okay, your personality, okay, your specific nature, which you could call personality, your character. Um, there, there's with maybe if you're working in a, in a, in a, a trading organization with the the rules and the, the philosophy of that organization. Okay, so alignment is so important. And I, I kind of use the hands as a kind of, if we're out of line, okay, like that, we're going to really struggle. We're going to have a lot of mental yes. pain from that. If our approach and strategies start to align with all these elements, you know, with our philosophy, again, our lifestyle, okay, our big picture philosophy, our outlook on life, but also our trading, our risk philosophy, you know, so if I come down to who I was, and you, you know, you learn that over time. You know, I, I didn't like the house approach. I was a market maker in investment banks. Okay. Um, and I, I don't know where this came from. It may have come from my mentors. It may have come from my reading. It may have come from my early trading experiences. Um, it possibly did because my first full week of running risk or first full month of running risk was October 1987. And we probably had the biggest schism in markets ever that month when the US stock market dropped 50% yes. on one day. Um, and, you know, that that early, I call that your baptism, your baptism in trading will probably shape the rest of your career in trading. Cool. And if your early baptism involves a really traumatic event, somehow that's going to shape you. And for me, that was a, wow, you can lose everything in one day and you cannot get out of positions 
because it, believe it or not what was happening then the traders were phoning up their brokers because it was all conducted on the phone then and the brokers were so overwhelmed and kind of panicked right that they weren't picking up their phones so people couldn't get out their positions so imagine that it's not online but it is like you're online going down so imagine you're sitting there with you know a lot of money invested in a particular stock and uh and you you see some really bad news that hits the market that you know that's going to cause that stock to get crushed so you go online to get out and then suddenly it comes up you know broker suspended service we'll let you know we don't know when we'll be back and you're like I, I literally can't get out of this position and you're just watching the price drop imagine what that does to you <laughs> and then by the time it comes back online you've lost a fortune you know maybe you've been ruined that was what was happening that day and that week and and, and that that leaves a big imprint on you okay so as a market maker I, which is what you do as a market maker you have to leave yourself open to exposure you have to quote prices to people and, and, and they, they they will hit you and you've got to run it and just stay with it i didn't like that that aspect of trading and maybe it's connected to somehow that early experience so i adapted the other side i wanted to be the risk taker i didn't want people putting me into positions i wanted to be the person taking the position taking the view who had some sort of control over the exit or at least what I felt was control over the exit. You never have complete control because those sort of conditions can come along any time, although they're obviously increasingly rare. Um, I, but I just felt more in control of what I was doing. So although I did the online market, the, sort of the online the market making in various forms, the house forms, for about you know six or seven years, I slowly adapted my trading style to the player style, where I became the risk taker. Now, bizarrely, actually, that, that didn't necessarily align with where I worked because they wanted you to be a market maker. Um, but that that worked for me and that became my approach going forward. OK, and that's what I really started to specialize in and develop um, and and choose how I entered the market. But, you know, you have to adapt your psychology to that. Mm. OK, that house approach tends to produce a regular income, a regular yield that works sporadically in terms of producing profits um, but when it does it can produce spectacular profits and you lose more often than when you win when you're doing that so you've got to sort of adapt your mindset to a mindset that's very comfortable losing often which no mindset is very comfortable losing often <laughs> but you have to teach yourself that so development of strategy can take a long time but it is so important to build something that is with who you are and also my character my personality is naturally risk averse um so again i had to evolve a style and a way of doing it that kind of suits my risk aversion you know so you know you and, and i haven't got time to go into the nuance of that now but you know i i kind of look at personalities in four senses you've got the, the risk averse style you've got the risk tolerant trader the risk averse trader you've got the the highly detailed um evidence-based trader and you've got the very intuitive emotional type trader so think of that as maybe a north south east west spectrum with bits in between and then sort of a neutral spot in the middle i, I find that what really matters to success is not whether you're one of those or the other but whether you're choosing a style or approach which aligns with who you are that is one of the most important things you know it, it, it's almost like if you're not using a style or approach that aligns to that it's like wearing a really badly fitting suit mm. you know you know it's cool. just going to restrict you and limit you and become difficult on you once you have that you can make you can be successful wherever you are on that on that kind of spectrum At least oh, it yes <laughs> very true so you know like uh in trading see loss is a part of game we know but there is one thing which is very important for us and every day we have to face that is called uh, uh how do you advise traders to handle stress and pressure especially during high volatile market <laughs> <laughs> okay um there's a lot about that in the book but there's a lot about of explaining where it comes from 
and it's not going to go away. You know, almost the more successful you become, the more stress and the more pressure you're going to have. Okay, it's a job that, you know, not being stressed doesn't go with the territory. And it's the same in any performance activity. You know, I, I talk about, um, I talk about the the idea of, you know, I don't label it in this book, but we can think of it as performance anxiety. You know, um, you know, if, if, if you're like me from the part of the world you're in, you're probably into cricket. And by the way, what a great couple of tests. <laughs> okay, hasn't it been amazing so far? Um, it's going to be a brilliant series. But, you know, it, I, I used to watch, I, I love watching sports people because they're people who learn how to deal with stress. You know, and, and from your part of the world, you watch someone like Sonu Gavaska. I mean, you know, legend, of course, but the way he handled it when he was out there, you know, nothing seemed to face him. But he probably was very stressed in his mind. Yes. You know, you know, and, and, and a, a, a great sportsman, they learn to deal with this. You know, the stress is out there, but the more trust they have in themselves, the more they build that trust. The more they understand what they're doing, the more they practice, the more they do the work outside of it. You know, when, when you watch a great sportsman, it looks like a natural gift to them, but it doesn't. It comes with a lot of hard work, a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, a lot of practice. You know, they spend years working on making it look like it's a natural gift, failing a lot along the way, struggling, suffering. You know, um, you know. I, I remember. I, I can't remember exactly what the quote was, and I might have put it in the book. It was, it was something from the comedian Steve Martin's biography, um, where people said, you know, he looked like a natural. He looked like whenever he stepped on the trade stage, he was never nervous. You know, and it, it it made him sort of when he hit the scene, it made him appear like an overnight success. And I think he spent something like, he said, I spent 14 years becoming an overnight success. Something like that. Okay. So 14 years struggling, preparing, dealing with the stress, you know, what's going up there, you know, nearly giving up many times. So you have to build that understanding of what you're doing. You know, you have to build an understanding. You know, the more aligned you are to yourself, the easier it becomes. Okay. You know, also, if you put yourself in positions where, you know, you're going to get into trouble. You know, if you're you're taking too much risk for the amount of capital you got, that is going to own you. Okay, a lot of people get into that mess. They put on too much. You know, if they're not using stops, if their position size is far too large, we talk about risk management. That's why risk management is so important, not just to staying in the game financially, but to managing what's going on up there. You know, if you're risking more than you can afford to risk. That is going to own your trading. You know, if you're trading and you need to make money from it to put food on the table, okay, it's going to own you. You're going to create stress that's going to undermine your performance and make it almost impossible for you to succeed. It's it's one of the reasons why with a lot of New York traders, a lot of young traders, okay, um, I do try and tell them to have another income if they can, so that they can learn trading. Because it's, you know, most people go. Yeah, I want to be a millionaire within six months. You know, <laughs> you might as well go to Vegas, you know, and put all your money down on, on the roulette table. You know, you've got as much chance. Um, it, it takes years to become great at it. And this is where, again, the sports analogies come in. You know, how many years of playing cricket does it take where you can become one of those greats? You know, where you can walk out on the pitch with the expectations of the world looking at you, where you've got some of the best bowlers in the world coming at you, you right. know, you know, and to be able to do that and not be nervous and not be anxious and not let that anxiety own you. That's what's happening in trading as well. You know, that takes years to get to that level. So, you know, have some money in reserve, have some income, trade small whilst you're learning. Don't go out there and want to become a millionaire overnight. You know, it's not going to happen. Not outside outrageous luck. Okay? And luck is not someone that you want with you on that. You want that with you on that journey, but you don't want to rely on it to make it work. Very true. Very true. And completely 
So, do you watch cricket? Oh, I love cricket. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe probably four days ago, uh, you wrote something about the Bumrah, right? Yeah, what a bowler. I mean, wow. Well, you know, it was incredible. Great, great, great. So, uh, like, who is the favorite sports person from India, especially in cricket field? Sanyo Kaviska. Oh, wow. that's wonderful. Wow. That was, goes back to my time. You know, if I go back to my time, you know, um, um, there was Kapil Dev. I mean, that guy, that was when I was young and when I was really growing up and I was really into it. You know, Sachin Tendulkar. You know, you look at these names, you know, but, you know, Kapil Dev for me, I, you know, I don't know if he's as big as some of these names now, you know, but what a player, you know, wow. bowler and batsman, you know, and what a person, you know, he was immense, <laughs> you know. It was just a joy to watch someone like that. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, great. Even you're like, <laughs> they are the ideals of India's lot of lot of fans. So wonderful, great. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so now now uh, let's uh, come into the topic. So, um, next question for you. Where do you see the trading industry heading in the next 10 years and what should traders do to prepare for these changes? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously, the industry itself is going down the AI route. Okay. Um you know, um, both professionally, but also, you know, the retail guys are getting access to amazing AI tools, AI systems. Um, yeah, you know, the, the market is always adapting, always evolving, always using the latest technology. Always, you know, the, 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 the first movers will always have an edge in that. Um, there'll be new technology that we don't even know which will come on in the next five or ten years or new versions of ai you know but i know people using it manipulating it to help them at the margins improve their trading but at the uh, uh, on the other side of that you still need to be a great risk taker you still need to know what you're doing you know i i, I know lots of people who build systems and quant systems and they really struggle because they're not risk takers. They haven't developed their risk taking. You know, really what I could say my book is, it's about helping people develop their risk taking skills. You know, all these different technologies are add-ons. And they can all give you an edge, especially if you know how to use them, how to manipulate them. But, you know, I'll give you a story if we go back to what I would say is, is not quite the early days of quants you know, of using quantitative analysis, using programming skills. But I worked with this individual who was incredibly smart, incredibly intelligent, you know, had an IQ at a certain level that was way beyond me, you know, was a mathematician, a, a physics expert, you know, was hired to build quantitative systems, quantitative risk systems in banks. And he was hired by the bank I was working at to build a system that could you know, sort of really just, you know, take all the data, analyze it, come up with trade recommendations, um, put the trades on, manage them, you know, so it was almost like not completely no touch, but as no touch as you could be. Um, and, you know, he, he came to us with, you know, I've got the ideas in my head, I'm ready to do it. It's, it's, on, it's on paper, I just need to build it. And he said within three to six months, you know, it was ready to go. You know, all the back tests had been done prior to him working. He he redid them just to double check. Um, and, and, you know, the back testing record was incredible. And I know my, my boss said to him, right, you're ready to go. Here's some capital, use it. And they said, yeah, just, just not quite ready. Just got to make a few tweaks. Uh, it's going to take another month or two. This went on for three years. Okay, just trying to tweak it, just trying to perfect it, just never getting it going. Uh, and, you know, my the head of trading just kept saying to him like every three months, you know, at some point we've got to put money to work here. You know, we're paying you a lot of money. The resources you've got are very expensive that we've given you. We've got to start showing a return on it. Um, but his delaying and deferring just dragged on for three years until eventually they came loose. 
because he couldn't do it. He couldn't take risk. He couldn't actually put the system to work. He was so fearful that what happens if it starts losing money? You know, what happens if it doesn't work? What happens if it's only worked in the past, but not the future? All these things were going on for him. He could not take risk. And being a risk taker is a big part of what I talk about in the book. It's not the same as finding value. Mm. Okay. True. You know, there's, there's finding value, which is being really analytical, you know, building those systems, etc. And there's taking risk, which is monetizing that analysis, monetizing those systems, doing the work. Okay. Staying with it. That's a completely different skill. And again, that's part of that process cycle I look at in depth. You know, and again, I bring my own experiences to that. I bring the experiences of the people I've worked with, my clients, I share their stories. Um, I share my story, you know, and, and it sort of hopefully brings to light what's happening. And, and, and a really good friend of mine who um, who I traded with in the early days of his career, and he's, he's still trading 31 years later, um, he just wrote a review of the book for me. And, you know, he said that reading this book was like, looking in a, a mirror of his entire trading career and that's what i wanted the book to be you know that that's what the coaching i had 15 years into my career was it held up a mirror to me as a trader and and in terms of you know it shone a light on the job i was doing and i suddenly had a much greater awareness of what the job was what i was doing and, and you know that shining a light and seeing yourself in a mirror just makes you so much more self-aware and you can adapt and you can change and that's what the book is trying to do for the, the readers of the book wow. that's all in there that was his review of this book hmm. okay there are already things i could add to it because you know the, the book was planned you know two two three years ago and written a couple of years ago and already since then you know through my work continue work that i do you know, I've got stuff that I can add to it or even even on the house player model, it's far more sophisticated and, and clear than I've written about in the book. I think I could really expand upon that and improve it. And there's certain things that I've written about it that I don't even agree with now because like everything, it's always evolving and always adapting. Um, okay. So, so could you please tell me uh, how many days it took for you to write the, the, the Mastering the Mindset book? Mastering the mental Well, it was it was a two-year project. The first year was the planning of it, the sketching it out, um, the, the the creating it, so that I was then ready to write. Mm. And then the writing took 14 months. Um, but most of the book was written in the last two months. About a third of it was written after a year. And then the last two thirds of it, which I think is the much better part of the book. I always say to people, you know, I hope you get through the first third because I think it could be a bit heavy. But then it really flows for me after that. Mm. And it really becomes a lot more enjoyable as a read. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so it was 14 months and then, you know, it was submitted to the publisher. We, we made a few edits afterwards, um, but not a lot. Um, so yeah, you could say it was, you know, but it, 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 was, it was 40 years almost in the development. If I'm gonna no, be no. Wow. you know, yeah, that's great, wonderful. Definitely, you know, like uh, if you allow me, definitely I will put it on my Twitter and I will ask the Indian public's Indian customers to kindly go ahead and purchase and go ahead and just read and review the book. Yeah, yes, I've been speaking to my publisher because you know it, it it's available on Amazon globally, but I'm not sure that means it's available in India. Yeah, that's available, Amazon. and yeah, that's available. I think it's available as uh, is okay, good, great. And I know the Audible is out now. Someone messaged me yesterday say the Audible is not out in India yet. But I've been speaking to the publisher and they said sometimes it takes a while to disseminate into other countries' Audible systems. So it should be out. Um, so hopefully if it's not out yet in Audible, it will be pretty soon. Um, I, I know they're talking to uh, an Indian publisher as well where there can be a, a, a more affordable in version um, than the Amazon version, which I think is priced at the, the US price. Yes. I've been speaking to the publisher. I've had so many emails from people, you know, is there going to be a more affordable Indian version? So I think that's what they're discussing with the 
with some sort of Indian publisher at the moment. Well, you know, like uh, if I tell you frankly, if you need any help from India, anything to publish it and all those things, do let me know. I have a very good publisher with us. They will definitely help you out. If you if you insist, then definitely I can talk to him in, on behalf of you. Okay, I I, I think the publisher have already got a kind of a global publishing relationship. That they're, they're part of the Pam McMillan Group, so they've got their own local relationships that they will have. Um, so I, I know they're talking to them already. So, That's great. Great, great, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. But anything from India, I am there. I am there with you. I'm standing right next to you. I'm always there for you. Well, I've got I've got so many great followers from India. You <laughs> know, um, you know, I'd love to have been over there for the World Cup, the Cricket World Cup. Although, you know, I think we came bottom, so I probably wouldn't have been so great. But so, I had a friend. I had a friend so who ran it. He said it was amazing. Only once. I was in Mumbai for a few days to give a workshop um, for uh, a, a consulting company a brilliant consulting company called final mile um um which it's great to look up their work they do a lot of work in the behavioral field developing behavioral solutions wow. um to help people and help you know improve people's lives so i, I did a two-day workshop for them wow. um and i got i got a chance to see them by a little bit and experience it which was pretty special no so, no that that's wonderful but yes uh let me offer you that you know, like maybe probably by end of this year or maybe next on the starting of next year uh we would be arranging a session and like people you likewise my like-minded people they are coming and they are joining around the globe and i invite you as well to please join us on the same journey i will definitely tell pleasure. you the uh, ideas what we are looking into it and who are coming so definitely you know like it will be good for us even if you join us yeah, okay. Well, that will be, be a week program, seven days program. I think that seven day you can book for us. Okay. okay. Well, you you talking about via Zoom or physically? Physically. In person. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, if you do that, I need to have a lot of notice. Um, I will tell my you. schedule. I got yes, a lot yes, of travel yes, schedule. Yes, yes. I will tell yeah. you each and everything before in six months ago. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But um, yeah, I mean, that, you know, but I mean, uh, other than that, I'd be very happy to. So, wow, great wonderful wonderful good okay. together finally i i got you <laughs> okay. okay wonderful so, <laughs> okay so let's move on now i have last two questions with you so what advice would you give to aspiring traders who are just beginning their journey in the financial market okay well i i would you know I, i'd i'd read you know prolifically about what risk is okay um, you know, my book's there to help to start bringing some exploration. You know, I would recommend reading the works of Nassim Taleb. Um, try and understand risk and uncertainty because that is that is what you're engaging with. That's how you make money in markets. You're making money from the uncertainty of markets. You're trying to monetize that. If you don't understand that, what you're engaging with, quite frankly, you're not going to succeed. Okay. All right. So the, the work of Nassim Taleb, you know, I, I don't know if you can see, I've got a whole series of his books up there. Yes. Um, the Black Swan, Fooled by Randomness, Anti-Fragility, you know, just read his works. So the guy's got a, you know, just incredible understanding. Not always the easiest read, but I would go ahead and read it. Uh, Annie Duke as well, her book, Thinking in Bets, that's also about risk and, you know, it's around, it's around a poker thinking applied to trading a big fan of poker thinking um th th there's many books listen to podcasts but practice you know practice trading put a little bit of money on the table open a small account you know you want it to hurt a little bit so you want real money out there you need to feel the pain because you're going to get a lot of pain a lot later on if you if you become successful you have more pain than you can ever imagine <laughs> you need to get used to that you need to get used to being punched in the face regularly um, um, but practice, practice method, you know, read lots of psychology books. There's another great, there's other great books, Best Loser Wins by Tom Hugard. Okay. Um, you know, th 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 there's, you know, read the stories, the market with the stories, Mark Douglas, you know, if you haven't read that, don't even bother trying to change, you know, um, th there are so many great books out there. Um, so go through them and practice and learn. Keep a journal, keep a diary as you're doing it. Okay. And there is one more one more book that Unknown Market Wizard series. 
Unknown market risks. Yeah, I've got a couple of people that I've coached were in that book. Um, so that there's five books in the market wizard series. Yes. Um, so a huge fan of that. Um, but absorb everything. Mm. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Immerse wonderful. yourself in that world. Okay. <laughs> great, great, wonderful. So the last question, but that we are moving to finally, can you share your personal philosophy or a piece of trading wisdom that has guided you throughout your career? This guided me throughout. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if it's the biggest thing. I've, I've got so many quotes um, that, that I, I adapt and listen to. Um, but there was, there was a quote I used to keep on a yellow sticker um, on, my, on my work, on my desk. And it was by the, the baseball player, Babe Ruth, the baseball legend. And it said, don't let the fear of striking out hold you back mm. okay um it, there was another version of it which was never let the fear of striking out get in your way and, and, and that, really that speaks to me about this game is risk you have to engage with risk okay you have to respect it you have to learn how to do it but you must never be so afraid that you can't do it mm. okay very true Okay, so I, I used to love that quote and I used to keep that attached to my desk. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, Listen, wonderful. I have to jump now because I've got to go on another. No, no, no. Please, okay. please, please, Stephen. Yeah, it's been really lovely talking to you and thank you for your time. And really, it's wonderful talking to you. And I hope definitely in future we'll connect once again. So it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you from my side. Thank you from Indian viewers. Thank you from globally, whoever will watch these videos. So thank you very much, Stephen. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Bye -bye. Okay, bye-bye. Wonderful, bye-bye.